Welcome everyone to Textiles and Tea with the Hand Weavers Guild of America. I'm Kathy Group. I'm the Advertising Marketing Manager for HT, and I get to be your host today. Today's episode of Textiles and Tea is sponsored by the hardworking 2021 Hand Weavers Guild of America Board of Directors. If you are interested in serving on the board, you can complete an interest form by logging into your account on the HGA website, weavespendie.org. We welcome your questions today and we'll try to answer as many as we can. We usually have more than we can uh, toward the end of the program, the last 15 minutes. If you would, please use the Q&A button and not the chat button. It kind of gets lost in chat. Today, I'm excited to welcome Heavenly Bresser. Heavenly is an award-winning hand spinner, published author, teacher, proud owner of Heavenly Nietzsche. Nietzsche, I always mess up your name, I'm sorry. After spending many years designing custom knit and, co and crochet accessories for clients, she became well known for her attention to detail and her expert finishing. The Knitting Guild Association recognizes Heavenly as a level one master knitter, and her love for knitting and crocheting eventually led her to becoming a hand spinner. She's written for major publications like Ply Magazine, Spinoff Magazine, and Tiny Studio Creative Life. When Heavenly wasn't teaching, vending, playing, and fibers, she repairs antique spinning wheels and has 30 with plans to open a museum in the future. I'm sure we'll hear more about that. So welcome today, Heavenly. We're glad to have you here. Hi. Hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Oh, it's wonderful. The very first question is always so important. What is your favorite tea? Okay, I have two favorites, but currently my go-to is a Japanese sencha tea, um, but I love oolong tea. Oh, all right. I have to say I've got my Kentucky mug today because basketball tournament starting. <laughs> nice. So how did you get started in fiber in general, weaving, spinning, all of that? Okay, so for me to transition into spinning and weaving and things like that, I first started off by crocheting. Um, I taught myself how to crochet when I was on maternity, maternity leave with my um, elder son. And I had to do something with my hands. I had taken a break from uh, retail and I figured, okay, I'm a new mom. I need to do something. I was always busy doing something. So, um, my um, husband actually um, gave me the idea to jump into fiber arts at that time. He, he asked me if I wanted to start crocheting. And I said, what is that? <laughs> I had no idea at the time <laughs> what that was. Um, so it kind of opened up a new world for me. I um, decided to go to a local uh, big box store basically to um, purchase some items. So I purchased some yarn and a kit that says, teach yourself to crochet. <laughs> so I said, all right, I'll teach myself to crochet. So I started there and I slowly transitioned from crocheting to transition um, to teaching myself how to knit. Um, I started teaching myself how to um, work with jewelry. And so I really started diving into so many different things, but then eventually I started helping um, out at a local yarn shop and the local yarn shop owner at around 2014, she decided that she wasn't ready to use her drop spindle kit. And she handed it off to me and said, maybe you can try and see what you think about spinning yarn. And again, at that time, I had no idea about the background of fibers. I just knew um, that I loved knitting and crocheting. Um, so I actually told her no. <laughs> I said, no, I don't think I want to learn how to use that. I will just stick to my yarn and stick to my knitting and crochet. And then I eventually took her up on her offer and I did 
try to teach myself to um, use the drop spindle at that time and things didn't click for me. Um, I did try to use um, fiber that came in the kit, but unfortunately the fiber was um, really compressed and um, compact. So it was really hard to pull apart. So I thought I was doing something wrong, but I actually didn't have like really good materials to start out with. So my hands were hurting, um, but then I decided I maybe I'll just look into spinning wheels instead. Maybe I, I can visit revisit the drop spindle and um, just start with the spinning wheel. And I ended up um, taking myself into a different direction with um, spinning wheels that are older. And I got my very first spinning wheel for $35 and a road trip from Illinois to Milwaukee. <laughs> Um, and I, it was basically my very first repair job, but I ended up spinning on it much later. So yeah, that's kind of how I ventured into that. Um, then after um, taking some time to spin, that's when I started um, trying out a little bit of weaving and I've been using a rigid heddle loom for most of the scarves and things that I make. Well, we have a picture here of you <laughs> with some of your wheels from what I understand this is not all of them so heavenly I understand that you have an addiction <laughs> yes <laughs> well how did this come about that you said you started with an antique wheel but what possessed you to you know to take in these orphans they needed a home, you know, they just call and they really need a home. Um, I actually started spinning on my modern wheel first. I started spinning on the Lindrum that's right in the middle, um, but I have a love for the antiques and I just love the character about them and also the history behind them. And I couldn't stop running into them. And part of the problem or addiction, as uh, most people will call it, is uh, my husband. Yes, I'm going to blame it on him. Um, he actually actively searches for um, antique toys and things of that nature. And his his dad also um, frequents the flea markets that are nearby and um, different places where you would find a spinning wheel. So um, I jokingly call my father-in-law the spinning wheel um, realtor. <laughs> Every time they find a spinning wheel, they let me know all about it. And I end up with them. They come home with me. <laughs> that, that's amazing. These are gorgeous. Now, somebody is asking, what is the, the loom? And I have to ask, too. It looks like a bicycle. The one on the bottom right. The one on the, the bottom right corner that has the two wheels on it. Yeah, it looks like a bicycle. Yeah, it does look like a bicycle. I actually have it right beside me in, in the uh, oh. in my camera view here because this is one of my favorites um, out of my entire collection is the one that's here. It is an accelerated or an accelerator wheel. So um, it spins um, thin yarns really well and it is very productive. So it's a joy to spin on. <laughs> one of my favorites. Love it, love it, love it, especially for sock yarns and um, yarns that I would use for like lace shawls and things like that. Well, it's amazing. I, I mean, I don't know everything there is now about spinning wheels, but I've never seen anything like that. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's really cool. I actually wrote about this one and also another one that's a little bit similar in um, the design. And um, this particular one is from Sweden, but um, I actually found this one at a flea market. And I can't blame my father-in-law for this one. Um, I was actually there in person <laughs> and I actually saw it and, and said to myself, is that a spinning wheel? Is it really? Um, and the guy that I talked to, um, he told me a little bit of history of his family, but come to find out, um, the history that he was telling me had no connection whatsoever to the history of the spinning wheel. <laughs> so that was really interesting yeah, to do a little bit of digging and oh. some research to find out more about it. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's wonderful. I absolutely love it. Well, we have um, a, a sewer, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, how did you go from being a spinner to a teacher? Uh, um, as far as the transition from being a spinner to a teacher, it 
kind of came up by a happy accident. I don't believe in accidents or coincidences really, but it was kind of like that. So um, myself and some friends, we ended up going to, we ended up attending a, um, a an event for um, knitting and crochet. And there were spinning classes there as well. And I'm like, oh, this is awesome. So, um, <laughs> My friends decided that they wanted to talk to um, the event coordinators and let them know that they would like to see more spinning um, classes um, with their event. And so um, it ended up leading into me putting proposals for that particular event. And from there, it really just took off. Um, but before that particular um, event, I was constantly being, um, I had the finger pointed at me every time that my spinning guild had their, um, our yearly meeting. <laughs> so we were planning like the next event for um, the, the months coming up for the following year. And every time someone said they wanted to learn something, I was getting the eyeballs and the Heavenly, you know how to do that. Why don't you teach us how to do that? So I ended up teaching several programs with my local spinning guild. So that also opened up the opportunity to um, teach in person with tons of members um, in front of me. And it was kind of, um, I would say a little nerve wracking because I will say I'm probably one of the younger members. And, and at the time I was a little bit newer compared to some of the people that were currently in the guild and still are in the guild. Some of them have been spinning um, before I was born. <laughs> so that's a little intimidating, <laughs> but um, they welcomed me to teach them. And I feel like I, I had a lot of um, wonderful opportunities to share um, different teaching styles there. So that really did open up the door for a lot of, um, I would say practice or a good way to start <laughs> with my teaching. Well, um, you are, speaking of teaching, you are teaching at the Maryland Sheep and Wool Festival, which has gone virtual this year, right? Yeah. Yeah. And congratulations, your classes were all sold out. I'm just checking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what do you think is the most difficult part and the most enjoyable part of going from teaching live in person to teaching um, through Zoom or online? I would say, um, the hardest part about that is the fact that what we're doing is very tactile. It's a tactile experience. Um, so trying to translate and or trying to articulate um, how to do certain techniques or really explain the feel of something, I think that is probably the hardest part. <laughs> um, and also making sure there are really great angles for the different techniques that are shown. So for some of the classes that I teach virtually, I will have an extra camera set up to make sure that you can really see as if you were in person exactly what I'm doing. Um, and I think it also feels a little bit different being in front of a screen. Um, you know, just trying to learn <laughs> in front of a screen and hoping that you're actually seeing what you think you see, especially with classes related to um, color. So I think that is probably the harder challenges of teaching um, virtually. Yeah, I imagine it's hard for someone to be able to say, is, is this tight enough? Is this loose enough? When you can't, you can't feel it. Can't feel, right. <laughs> And you're, I never thought about the, the color on a computer. You're right. Every screen is different. So you never know what you're yes. getting. Well, congratulations on Maryland Sheep and Wool. I, I hope that goes well. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I'm excited about that. Now, as you talk, especially when you were talking about the guild wanted you to teach things, it seems like you have done a lot of self-taught. You've gone out and gotten the information yourself rather than taking a class or having someone teach it. You went out and found the information and the knowledge on your own. Yeah. And you've received a lot of awards for your work. You are very accomplished. What are the advantages or disadvantages of learning on your own, of finding the information on your own rather than taking a class? Oh, I feel like this is such a loaded question. <laughs> I would say um, as far as the, I guess I'll start with the disadvantages first. Um, I would say with the disadvantages, it's 
you feel like there's a lot of things you don't know <laughs> that you don't know. <laughs> so um, the disadvantage is a lot of trial and error um, to, to learn a technique or to um, get to a certain place where a class or a workshop would be helpful, where someone can fill in the gaps for you and kind of help guide you through the process. So I think um, learning on your own does have that huge disadvantage where you feel as though you're kind of just in the sea <laughs> swimming all by yourself. <laughs> um, but I do think um, as far as the advantages for um, being self-taught is being able to not refer to so many other um, ways of doing things and just really opening your mind to different possibilities. And I think that is, even though I teach classes, I also, um, I pretty much let my students know that this is one of the ways that I do this and this is how I got here. And I spent a lot of time working on this particular thing to show this to you so you can try it also. But I always reassure them that there's another way to go about it. Um, and there are other things to explore that this is not the end all be all for you know a particular technique or, a, um, or for a workshop in general. So um, I feel as though just being self-taught, I feel a little more creative in some areas and I feel like there's less restrictions mentally for me. Um, so I kind of like that. <laughs> I kind of like that free thinking um, that I have going on in my head all the time. <laughs> well, I admire your perseverance because I was thinking back to what you were talking about at the beginning of um, the, 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 not bad, but the roving that you got that was too tight. You know, you could have just given up and walked away. And so I admire your persistence of, I'm going to keep trying because you don't know that it's, I mean, that would be hard to keep going if you thought this is what weaving is going to be. I mean, spinning is going to be from now on. So yeah. I admire your perseverance for doing that. Yeah, I was a bit angry about that um, <laughs> because my wrist hurts so bad. Um, but the advantage if I had taken a class or if I knew a little bit more about fibers would have been one of those situations where the frustration could have been removed much faster. <laughs> so, you know, so it's almost like, it's nice to have both to just remain curious about things um, and also keep a, an open mind that um, even if something's not clicking, there's still an opportunity in a window to revisit that particular thing. And you never know, you might be really good at it. It took a while for me to um, return to the, the drop spindle that I practiced on and I love it. Uh, it's one of those things I really, really like and it opened the door for me to work with support supported spindles as well so i i'm kind of happy about that uh situation <laughs> now <laughs> well it seems like as you've gone through life and you've had life experiences that they have kind of solidified what you wanted to do because you wanted to do other things in your life and you this would happen and that kind of made you go this way and this would happen and that kind of made you go this way and that if you could go back to the younger heavenly, you know, into high school, early 20s, what would you tell her? I would look in the mirror, <laughs> sit her down and tell her um, that basically you can do whatever, whatever you want. And you really should just feel free to try um, different things. I originally originally wanted to um, become a brain surgeon and part of that thinking was because as a younger child I was told often that you'd be a great doctor because of the academic um, how well I did academically in school and you know just just parents saw it and other people have had these thoughts that you'd be really good as a doctor. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to be a doctor. Maybe I'll be a brain surgeon. You know, that would be really fun. But I realized that is not where my, that's not where my heart would be. Even now, it just, I just couldn't see myself doing it. I applaud others <laughs> that are able to do that. And I think it's a very, you know, awesome field. Um, the medical field is really awesome, but I, um, I do love science and math, and there are so many different subjects that I enjoy, and I enjoy writing too. Um, but I feel as though at my younger self, 
um, did not think about a lot of other possibilities. And I feel like everyone has things that they're naturally gifted in um, and some things that they, um, there are some things you may never have thought of trying that you should just try and see how it goes. So um, I feel as though now I can look back and say, I'm proud of her <laughs> for doing really well, but I also would tell her to be open-minded about things and um, yeah, just to be very open-minded about uh, the future. Well, speaking of science, uh, <laughs> you also dye yarn. Yes. And we have an image of some of your work. Yeah. Do you think your love of science and that you were drawn to science is an advantage to learn about dying and that has kept you involved in dying, that whole scientific aspect of it? Yes. I, I think um, not only the science, um, not just science, but math, both of it coupled together, mm -hmm. I find to be um, like a wonderful, wonderful <laughs> wonderful team of two things I really like um, that makes dyeing so much fun. I like to make um, custom colors and I, I just love playing with different possibilities with color and yeah I do think that my um, love for science definitely opened me up to um, enjoying dyeing even more. I really do think so. It's like a one big experiment that is repeatable. <laughs> and there's so many different variables, whether it's um, different bases of fibers or you know different colors basically that you start out with. Um, but yeah, I, I truly believe that it has a lot to do with it. <laughs> what kind, I know somebody's gonna ask this, what kind of dyes do you use? So I have experimented some with um, natural dyes and I do find that fun, but I mostly use um, professional acid dyes for um, what I do mm -hmm. currently, yeah. Okay. Well, you traveled from Chicago to Oregon to participate in a Sheep to Shaw <laughs> um, competition with a group of people you didn't even know, right? And then, um, and here's a picture of you at the yeah at the competition. Great t-shirts, by the way. I thought those were cool. Yeah. What was your experience of collaborating with these people that you've never met and, and uh, not having control over the end product? You were part of it, but not the whole thing. Oh, okay. So for this competition, that was a lot of work <laughs> to <laughs> try to get so many people together um, to be able to have everyone Pretty much on the same page as far as the grist that we're spinning for, um, having everyone agree on a design for the weaving, the final weaving. Um, it was a lot of work to put together online. Um, it would have been a little bit easier if we were all in the same state <laughs> and we were all able to at some point come together to help with warping um, the loom and just doing some things together would have been much easier. I think that um, my experience with leading a team before this particular one was helpful. So I've led a, a team in for the Wisconsin Sheep and Wool Festival and um, all of the team members were in Illinois. So we were able <laughs> to meet together. So in order to lead the team for Oregon, we had a lot of communication online and we had our own um, group, our own online group so we can actually talk to each other. We sent sam samples in the mail. We tried to do everything that we possibly could um, in order to um, work out the fine details without even seeing each other. And the funny part is I had, I think I met only one person on the team in person before all of this, <laughs> like before the actual competition. So we really didn't know each other. We were just hoping everyone's going to show up <laughs> and we'll be able to find everybody <laughs> and find our spot. So it was just, it was a lot of work, but I think I think we did really well considering um, so many different you know variables as far as trying to um, stay in constant uh, communication with one another. Um, and everyone worked really hard, so I'm really proud of that team. They did a really good job. Well, good. I didn't realize there was all that pre work of I've never done a sheep to shawl. I, I didn't realize you had to do all that before you even got there. Yeah, it depends on um, the way that the sheep 
um, keep to shawl um, competition is structured. So for um, this particular one, we were able to um, warp our, the loom ahead of time um, and bring it to the competition. And we processed the fleece for um, the weft um, there. So right during the competition, that's where we're doing all the processing. And I think um, part of the challenge of trying to get the logistics together is seeing what everyone's good at or what they feel more comfortable with doing. And <laughs> sometimes it's hard to say what you're really good at or you know what you don't feel very comfortable <laughs> with doing so um some of us wore multiple hats um in order to you know just try to make sure we weren't falling behind for our weaver because our weaver sarah she was amazing she was really fast and i'm like oh my gosh we need to spend more <laughs> spend more process more quick 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 so um um for myself personally i um did some of the prep work with the drum carter, we were able to use one for our team um, or for that particular competition. Um, I did the prep, a lot of prep work with the um, drum carter and creating bats, but then I also doubled up as spinning as you saw in the photo. Um, and then we had different people plying. And at one point I was helping with the plying. I'm like, we need more yarn. So it was just, it was a lot of chaos at times, but it was nice to know that so many people were able to do different things too, so we can relieve others. So it's, yeah, it was interesting, <laughs> very interesting. Well, your work has made the cover of Spinoff Magazine, and the article you wrote was about wild silk. And what attracted you to this fiber? And in the article, you, you talked a lot about combining it with other fibers. Um, why was that part of your focus in that article? So for that particular article, I wish I could say that was my original idea was to try that. <laughs> um, but I was actually approached with the idea um, oh, okay. to, to go ahead and try it and write about it. And I really believe part of the approach was because I have a, um, that experimentation mentality. I want to explore everything. <laughs> So uh, I think that's really where, you know, that the heart of that question for, um, you know, participating with the and writing for this article came from. Um, so it was just, it was one of those things that I said, you know, I haven't spent that much time working with Wild Silk, so why not? And I ended up being, um, I wouldn't say addicted to Wild Silk, but I absolutely love it. <laughs> so I actually spent a lot of time um, developing my own um, blends for Wild Silk. And I have that article to thank because that's one of the, that is the first um, article that I had that was published. And it also managed, I managed to make the cover of the, I mean, that's so cool. And I just cannot leave Wild Silk alone. <laughs> so I, um, yeah, I spent a lot of time um, just basically working with Wild Silk since, and I still am working with Wild Silk. In fact, I'm writing another article that has <laughs> Wild Silk featured in it. And this one has um, alpaca and Wild Silk in the blend as well. So I'm telling you, I just love it now. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, there are a lot of visual people who are in the visual arts, such as fibers, that really don't write that well. But you have a real, you have a real strong writing skills. You, you've written articles, you've got uh, posts throughout the internet, you have wonderful writings on your website. If you could write a book, would you write a book and what would it be about? Thank, first, thank you. Um, glad you like my writing. <laughs> um, I love writing and um, I actually like it so much that I decided to join a local writers club with my library. So I joined this club, let's see, it would be two years. Yeah, I think it's about two years now. And um, I get a chance to listen to other writers and how they write. And it, again, it kind of opens you up to different things. So the writers in that particular group are not five arts related. <laughs> um, they write about all types of other things, but it's really not, um, it's really not the same, um, I guess, arena or field that I'm in or what, like, what I'm interested in, but I like hearing how they write and different examples of writing. So um, I do spend a lot of time 
um, reading about writing and, and I do have ideas for books and I guess, <laughs> I, could, I guess I could share some of that here with one of the um, book ideas that I have is actually related to color work because I absolutely love color, but it's in an area that I feel um, other writers have not really um, I guess pursued and or having gone into a very in-depth um, uh, perspective concerning this and it's one of my favorites with fractals so um, yeah so I, I am writing I'm currently writing about it but I'm also spinning for it as well so the spinning process I feel it's a lot of work <laughs> but um, I really enjoy color so that that is one area that I absolutely absolutely feel as though I must write about because I can't get enough of it. <laughs> so yeah, that's definitely one of them. The other, maybe we'll save that for a later date. <laughs> well, shoot, I was going to say, oh, you got it here first. We got half of it here first. You got half of it here first. Right. <laughs> um, well, who, who influences you? Who are your people are that you admire or were there events in your life that have really influ influenced you as a as a fiber artist I you know as far as um people that influence me I feel I feel like I find that there is there's just a variety um it, and it's not necessarily attributed to one particular person it could be a piece of artwork that just makes me want to look into a color or look into a or read a particular story or something like that i don't necessarily have like one person that i like really 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 you know cling on to or really 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 like um as far as or i would say has a huge influence in that sense um but i feel it's very collective for me <laughs> it could just be little hints of things here and there so it's not just one person for me where do you get your ideas for colors or? Oh, okay, well, one of them might sound a little strange, but in my dreams. <laughs> really? No, that's I great, I love dream, that. I actually dream about colors often um, and colorways. And uh, that, that tells you how much I think about color <laughs> with uh, color relationships. Um, I also find that when I study um, history and color and looking at different color wheels and things like that, I feel as though sometimes ideas just jump out at me. And um, I also like to look at other uh, mediums of things that I've done in the past where um, I can tie that into the fiber arts. So for instance, I worked a lot with polymer clay and that happened to be one of my favorite things to do when I was making um, jewelry, when I was making it more often, <laughs> put it away for a little bit. But um, while I was working with polymer clay, I would work on making um, different colors. And I would mix so many little bits of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and make all types of colors. And I actually made my own um, a binder with tiny little what looks like teardrops or raindrops with different colors in there. And those can be like a source of inspiration for me if I ever feel like I really need to see color <laughs> and I really want to um, replicate something that I made with clay with my dyeing, I would go to my Palmer clay um, binder. <laughs> what a great idea. Oh, That's yeah. a wonderful idea of mixing it works. mediums too. And it works. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I noticed when I went on your website and I was reading this some about you, you are kind of like an art, I hate saying activist because I know that has another kind of connotation, but you're very much involved in reaching out to the community and bringing the community together. Um, you know, you have online groups, right, that meet and chat. Um, you have events. Can you talk some about that, the, the what they are and the why of them? Yeah, okay, so I, a, a long time ago, I started um, doing what I would call a live craft and chat on Wednesdays, and I would um, host 
just basically myself just working on different projects and I would do this through Facebook and I would see if anyone's interested in seeing what I'm doing and just basically try to connect with people and see what they're working on. A lot of times it, the person could be painting, they could be working on anything that's not fiber arts related, <laughs> um, but it, it made for great conversation. Um, it also made me feel as though I had some sort of company um, as opposed to just doing everything alone and kind of by myself. Um, then I noticed that there was so, like, so much interaction that I felt the need to, um, to have my own group where I can invite others to come in and then you can share the pictures of the things you're working on. So if you were crafting, whether you're making jewelry, whether you're making, um, you're knitting, you're, make, you're weaving with something, um, or if you're spinning, you could share the projects that you're working on. Um, I also felt as though I needed to share some of my organization um, solutions that would help um, fiber artists um, with the organization because I find that's one of those questions everyone has like where do I put my stuff. <laughs> um, so I started doing little um, videos live videos to share some of my organization tips um, ways that I schedule time so that I am staying focused on a task that I really want to finish and how to curb some of the startitis, as I call it, <laughs> where you want to start a million projects, but you really don't want to complete, you know, the one thing that's really important. So I felt as though I had an opportunity to um, help people in areas that they felt that they need, you know, some sort of uh, help. <laughs> and um, it ended up turning into a nice uh, community. and. Nowadays, um, that that particular group, although I am not doing the live craft and chat videos on Wednesdays anymore, um, we do have Zoom sessions on Mondays, wh which is basically what I call a study hall. <laughs> so I have everyone sign in to the um, Zoom session and everyone's muted, but we can see everyone. So it's basically a library setting. <laughs> I miss the libraries. So this is kind of the idea behind it. Um, but basically everyone would sign into the Zoom session, you grab your projects and you just work on your projects for as long as you'd like um, for that session. And then an hour before the session's over, everyone unmutes themselves and say how far they've come or you know what they've worked on doing during the session. And then we also had uh, have a Zoom session on Wednesdays and we actually chat during those sessions. <laughs> So sometimes it's productive <laughs> and sometimes there's a lot more chatting, I think, than crafting, but it's nice to have that social aspect and feel as though you're with other people. And we do have people from different parts of the world. We have friends from the Netherlands that come every week. It's just so fun um, to get to know everybody. But um, the Zoom sessions are hosted on the Facebook group and it's called the Hand Spun Experience. And um, as far as other like events and things, we have sow cows. So we have spin along, uh, knit along type of things where we will support a, a, uh, a designer and um, we will highlight that designer, give them a chance to tell us about their design and their pattern. And then we'll all work towards that. And then we also um, will highlight farmers so we can support them as well, um, especially with everything being shut down last year. It was a wonderful opportunity to really reach out and see if we can do something fun and also be able to financially support, you know, some of our favorite people and some people that we might not have um, had the opportunity to meet otherwise. So um, that group has been a lifesaver <laughs> because honestly, with the shutdowns last year, I don't know what we would be doing. <laughs> I mean, some of us, you know, are so used to traveling and visiting people and things. And so now that we have it so that we have at least two sessions a week, we still feel as though we have a community there. And um, we also participate in the Tour de Fleece that takes place every year. And um, the Tour de Fleece um, normally coincides with the Tour de France. And that is a wonderful time to um, try new techniques or to spin towards a goal, um, spin yarn for weaving, spin yarn for whatever it is that you'd like. And I think it's, that's a very fun time as well. But we participate in that. 
So I know these are all Facebook events, but can they go to your website and find more information about them? Yeah. Yep. Okay. All the information, um, once you go to um, heavenlyknitshay.com, the information for the groups are, it's on the very first page <laughs> and you can find out like how you can be involved. Mm -hmm. Heavenly Knit Shay. Mm -hmm. I got it. Fine. You got it. It's knitting and crochet together. Yeah, crochet. You to yeah. <laughs> it was a little hard. Well, this next question, I mean, just talking to you, I feel like a slug and I'm tired. You have a family, you teach, yeah. you write, you have an online group, you have an online store. How do you make time for your art that you get to weave or crochet or dye for you? How do you make sure you have that time? So <laughs> I, I make sure I just have to, even if I have to schedule it in to my planner or one of my dry erase boards, I will actually make sure every week that I'm working on something, something that's going to um, provide some sort of excitement for me. Um, something that's going to, um, that I will eventually be able to wear at some point. Um, I do schedule it in and I also um, bring a lot of projects with me um, when we travel. So if I am in a car, I have Usually it's a project for me <laughs> that I'm bringing in the car. Um, I will spin in the car, but I also will bring um, socks to knit on. I actually have some that I'm telling you, I keep it with me <laughs> because you never know. I am um, sitting here right now and knitting while you're talking I to I could us. be. Yeah, I really could be. But this one, I'm actually almost done with these. Aw. So, and I couldn't tell you the pattern. I feel so bad. I should know that. Um, but I started these a while back, but I just need to. Go ahead and do the kitchen's um, stitch and finish it off. So I will have new socks. So um, I do um, set aside time to um, work on projects for myself. But also, what the one of the fun things about teaching is that I make a lot of samples for things, and um, those samples sometimes translate into um, projects for myself. So I will work on samples and I'll say, oh, I really like how that turned out. And then I will just go ahead and keep spinning more of it. And then I end up with a full, you know, shawl or something that I am going to enjoy. So it actually works nicely. And then I'm able to show my students as well what that little sample turned into later on. So it's, it just kind of works, works out that way, which is nice. Well, um, let's take some questions from the audience. We've got lots of questions. Sure. So let's see if we can start. Now, um, I'll go to the top up here. Now, do you prefer a single pedal or a double pedal wheel? Um, I prefer a, hmm, that is a great question. Single treadle or double treadle? Ah. I really like them both. I I would say I will say I like maybe I like the double treadle a little more. That's a trick question. It's hard. That's well, really hard. Good hard question. question though. Well, Molly Gerhard wants to know. Um, she said my hand spun wool socks always gets holes in the heel. Speaking of socks, um, do you blend with other fibers with wool for socks to make them last? wear better a couple other people want to know about this too okay so for my socks i prefer to um, use reinforcement thread in both the heel so going um i guess it depends on your construction for your socks mm -hmm. but usually if i'm working a, a heel flap i will work the um use the reinforcing thread Let's see if i have some here I actually should have some because i used it for this project but if not, I'll just kind of describe it. So um, there are reinforcement threads that can coordinate with the colors that you're working with. So it's actually hidden and you can hold it alongside your yarn or you can weave it in later. So you can turn your um, sock inside out and um, add the reinforcement thread after the fact. Um, I find that that's very, very, very helpful. <laughs> um for socks is to just have that um prepared because i have ruined some heels on socks before <laughs> so frustrating and um having to have to having to um 
the need to darn socks, I am not a fan, <laughs> not a fan. Um, so it's nice to have basically a skeleton um, that you can work with or a framework so that it's easier to um, duplicate or recreate stitches uh, if you um, have holes in your heels or in your toes. Um, I will, if I am spinning um, for, specifically for socks, I will spin um, either tighter, a tighter ply for the heel so it wears a, a little less, <laughs> um, or just use a totally different fiber for the heel and the toe, and I will have everything else the same. So I hope that answers that question. That's, that's great. Yeah. Um, somebody was asking, what's the most, oh, this is Fazia Rizvi. What is the most challenging antique wheel to spin on so far and which one was the easiest? Hmm, let's see, the most challenging, the most, I will say, hmm, I will say the most challenging will probably be the um, pendulum wheel. So the one that uh, we had a slide with me um, with uh, a dress and uh, that huge wheel, that wheel is probably the most challenging uh, wheel that I have encountered so far um, because there is so much coordination involved with using a wheel like that and um, using your foot to instead of treadling in the normal fashion, you're actually using your foot to control the draft. Um, and that's just very different. So um, I think that's the most challenging, but I absolutely love that wheel. And I'm pointing that way because it's in the, opposite, the other room over there. Um, but uh, I love that wheel. So I don't know, I kind of like challenges though, so. <laughs> You do, you do. You yeah, I, I kind of like the challenges. Um, so any wheel that's kind of, um, that will put a lot of twist into your yarn is usually a challenge for most. So some people will have a um, harder time spinning on Canadian production wheels um, because of how much twist um, enters into their um, drafting zone. Mm -hmm. And um, you feel as though you don't have as much time to draft if you don't, you know, treadle at the right speed and things like that, or use to have the right fiber prep um, for wheels like that. So the accelerator or accelerated uh, wheels can be a challenge as well. But again, I like that. <laughs> so I'm like, it might be a challenge for most, but I do like it. Um, Michelle was asking that in that sample of wild silk and alpaca that you plied together, were they equal amounts of the both fibers? And were they blended together before they were spun? Yeah, so I had the, these um, processed at the mill um, and they are not equal amounts. It's 75-25, so 75% alpaca, 25% um, peduncle wild silk. So that is the mix. And then I spun, spun the fiber to get the yarn. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Pat Cotter, I think, is another one we're going to have to do an intervention on. How do you store all your wheels? I also collect older wheels and as an ongoing thing with me. Do you have them all out? Do you cover and put them aside until you use them? Well, okay, so I actually maxed out the space in our townhome for wheels. <laughs> um, back, I would say probably when I had about 25-ish Spinning wheels is it's pretty much is the max for um, what I can fit in here comfortably without being nervous that I might bump into a wheel um, just getting up in the morning. <laughs> um, I have tons of wheels, <laughs> excuse me. I have tons of wheels that live, <laughs> that live in my bedroom, um, but they actually look amazing there. So. I, I want to say I have at least 10 wheels that actually live in my master bedroom and they look amazing. And this one, the one behind me is one of the 10 that normally lives upstairs. And it's nice to look at when I see it in the morning, I'm like, yeah, it's excited to see them. Um, but I now have over 30. I'm actually getting closer to 40. And part of what's going on here <laughs> 
I'm calling all of my friends out right now. <laughs> but part of what's going on here is that I, I just recently um, had a wheel dropped off at my front door <laughs> by a fellow guild member. Um, and she decided that she um, would like me to go ahead and repair it. And it needs a lot of work. So um, some of the ones that need tons of work or have so many parts that are missing or need um, just way more attention than I can give it currently. I actually have a storage unit just for the wheels. <laughs> so if I need to grab a wheel, I just take a little drive, take out a wheel, swap them out if I need to. Um, but yeah, now I actually got to a point where I need a storage unit, but it's okay. It'll, it'll, it works. It works. <laughs> Speaking of repair, Carol Espinoza wants to know who fixes the wheels. Do you fix them? I fix I fix the wheels myself. Um, when I when I first started um, doing repair jobs, I I did everything um, on my own, um, with a few exceptions where I needed my husband's help to hold some things together. <laughs> um, he would jump in and help with those things, um, but there were a few. Um, I would say two wheels where I've had to send out a part to a professional um, woodworker, someone that specializes in restoring older wheels. So um, if I had a flyer that was um, broken and it was too much of a repair job for me to take on at the time, I have sent out um, a flyer and a whirl to um, Spirit Wood in Iowa to mm -hmm. fix that for me and also a treadle. So he's been, um, John's been amazing um, <laughs> with uh, fixing those things for me. But now I have my own woodworking tools and I have been working towards restoring them all on my own. I know, I see that face. Kathy's like, what in the world? <laughs> I know. So I have, I have a wood lathe um, and I love it. I actually recently have been making nasta pinnas because I'm working on an article about them and I decided to make my own um, and and use it. And so, yeah, I'm having fun with it. <laughs> so, yeah, I do repair my own now and restore my own, but have had help in the past for sure. You make me tired. Um, <laughs> where did you find your pendulum wheel? That's where, from Lori where? Waters. Lori Waters wants to know, where do you find your pendulum wheel? Where did I, oh, okay. So this is one of those situations where I can um, blame my husband again. So he was looking for antique toys and he was on a uh, website looking for them. And lo and behold, he finds a pendulum wheel. Um, like how nice. <laughs> it's been a dream wheel of mine for, I don't know, let's see, since 2016, I believe. I've been wanting to get my hands on one. And uh, he saw a listing. Um, on a website and he messaged the guy that was selling it. He messaged him right away and he said, um, he let him know that we were interested. We literally went, I went and a friend of mine, we went the very next day and it came home with me. <laughs> so it was a very, very quick thing. And I was just like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. But it did have a lot of uh, broken parts. So um, it, that was a bit of a job for me to restore myself, but it works wonderfully. Well, a couple of people are asking, I'm kind of combining some questions here. What do you normally spin and what is your favorite fiber to spin? What do I normally spin? Oh, I spin a little bit of everything. There you go. Um, do you have I, a favorite? I would, wild silk, wild silk and wild silk blends just so happens to be like my go-to, my favorites, I just love it. Um, I love spinning alpaca. I just haven't spun a lot of it alone um, in a while because I, when I first started spinning, I started spinning for um, farmers and I did a lot of trades where I would spin some of the fiber and I would keep some and it was really fun, but I spun so much of it. 
<laughs> that I just have a lot just sitting. <laughs> and not that I don't know what to do with it, but I just have a ton of it. And uh, I think I was all alpaca out for <laughs> maybe six months. <laughs> but um, I, I spun it and it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful fiber to work with. Um, but I like working with all different types of wool um, breeds is what she breeds as well. So I don't think I have a fiber outside of wild silk. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, Rosalind Mackin wants to know, where do you source the wild silk? The wild silk? Okay, so it depends. I actually, um, I have some that came from Trainway um, and there are some that are overseas in the UK. Um, for some of the blends that I have, I'm able to get some that are overseas, um, but I do have a local um, fiber shop that if I really need something, I like to support her. <laughs> if I really need to grab something, um, she actually gave me quite a bit of wild silk for the, the article that um, mm. I had written. And, um, but yeah, I try to support you know, local if I can, but otherwise it's, it just really depends <laughs> on which particular thing I'm looking for. Um, but yeah, it's, it can be anywhere. So um, I did get recently, I um, purchased, I don't say recently, but over the past few months, I purchased um, what's essentially um, Erie silk hankies. So they look very similar to um, the Bombix silk hankies, but they're smaller. And I've been dying a lot of those and it's so much fun to work with. But I work with one particular company that makes, that has those process. Um, I haven't found them anywhere else. So, yeah. Well, somebody was asking, if you're a beginner, what kind of, this is from Carol Devininski, what suggestion of a wheel to start as a beginner? If you can get your hands on a modern wheel to start, even if it's used, um, I, I recommend starting with a modern wheel if you can. Um, but if not, I would recommend looking into a Saxony style wheel um, and having another spinner if possible. Um, with you to make sure all of the essential parts are there <laughs> um, because that's usually <laughs> that's usually a big issue is um, that people will see a wheel and they're like oh this is a great deal but the majority of it is missing <laughs> so you're not going to get far with that wheel unless you have someone um, that is able to make parts for you which can can become a bit expensive depending on the parts um, so if possible I would um, see if you can get your hands on a modern wheel, even if it's used. Um, some of the ones that come up for sale most often or more frequently than others would be an Ashford traditional. A lot of people will start with an Ash Ashford traditional wheel um, as a beginner wheel. Um, for me personally, I was able to um, purchase a Lindrum double treadle and everyone has their favorite. So if you ask a different fiber art artist, they'll say, this is the wheel, <laughs> you know, this is the wheel you have to get. Um, but as a beginner, you don't necessarily have to spin a fortune um, to get yeah. started spinning. It's just that if you are searching for antiques, it's just a little bit harder to uh, scan through those and see which ones will actually work for you and not give you so much trouble. Well, I cannot believe we're out of time. And I'm sorry to all those folks who didn't get questions answered. Some of these folks, um, I encourage you to go to the website and ask your question. And um, I'm sure Heavenly will try to as, answer as much as she can. Heavenly, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. But I'm glad you had a good time. Okay, now <laughs> when the book is done and published, you'll come back, right? Okay. Yes, we'll talk. The mystery we'll book. Another talk that we'll talk. We'll talk. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> if you want to learn more about Heavenly and see the million and one things this <laughs> woman is involved in, uh, you can go to Heavenly Niche. I got it. Niche.com. And you can yes, see her. It. Um, you can read her articles, see her videos. Um, she is a wealth of knowledge. So check that out. 
um, I want to give a special thanks to our hardworking board of directors from the Ham Weavers Guild of America for sponsoring this episode today. If you or your guild or your business would like to sponsor Textiles and Tea, please learn more at weavespindye.org. Textiles and Tea is supported by the generous donations to the Fiber Trust. If you would like to see more programming like this, please support HTA by becoming a member or donating or both at our website at weavespindye.org. If you missed part of this episode or you would like to watch it again or you want to share it with a friend, please um, go to the HGA Facebook page and it will be recorded and it'll be on the Facebook page. You do not have to be a Facebook member to watch it. Uh, you can just go on there and pull it up. Next week, I am very excited that we are going to have tea with Cameron Taylor Brown. I hope you all have a wonderful weekend and week. We'll see you next Tuesday. Happy tea. Bye, everybody.